Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Abhishek Nagraj. I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley, uh, where I'm kind of an applied economist by day. Uh, most of my focus is on uh, understanding how to engineer good communities. And today, I'm going to be talking about uh, what I've learned through this process over the last few years um, and how it relates to OpenStreetMap. Uh, so, so that's me. I've written a few papers on OpenStreetMap that you can find uh, on, on my website. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about experiments. Uh, and I talk about how experiments can be mutually beneficial for OpenStreetMap to help design and engineer communities that work better than they already do. And also for researchers and social scientists like me to help us learn something broader about how human beings behave. And I'm going to give you a few examples of how that could work. So OSM is often faced with really tough choices. Like a great example of that uh, is when these tough choices lead to controversies. So th this is a, a famous blog post from 2014 uh, going back and forth about all the different debates about imports. People, people who've had their uh, mail, sort of had their inbox uh, flooded with these emails uh, uh, need to know nothing more about what I'm talking about, right? But you get these sort of ideological and philosophical debates about whether policy X or something that we do is good or bad for OSM, and there's, a, there's basically a shouting match, uh, and then at the end, everyone gets tired. So what I'm going to propose is like a way forward uh, where we can bring data to this problem uh, and, and inform this debate and sort of move it beyond uh, just shouting matches. So. Um, how are others in, in industry making some of these decisions? They're relying on A-B tests, right? Like, should, should this font uh, on the Google link be 12 or 13 points? What color blue it should be? They just test it out and see how that affects users, and, and they let the data guide them. And you might think that this is something that commercial organizations have a lot of time and money to spend on, so it's something they do, but doesn't really happen otherwise. Well, Wikipedia has lots of people that think about this systematically. So this is... Uh, uh, public data on Wikipedia's experiments on banner design. So, you know, when Wikipedia asks you for money, they've tried out hundreds of different versions of Jimmy Wales' face asking you for $5. Uh, and and, they, and some, a crowd member contributed this message that says, if, everyone's don if everyone reading this donated $5, this campaign would be, open, uh, would be over in an hour, right? So, this was a crowdsourced message that ended up being extremely effective um, that the community learned through a process of experimentation. Right? So, so my inspiration here are these kinds of projects and asking whether we can bring a spirit of experimentation into OpenStreetMap. So this kind of work has actually had a lot of impact. On, uh, on how the way these communities are run. So it's not purely an academic exercise that allows us to write papers, but it also helps us shape how we should run OpenStreetMap going forward. So there's a famous article in the MIT Tech Review that talks about the decline of Wikipedia, um, and it talks about how, over time, we've learned that Wikipedia isn't as fervent as it used to be. All of this w article was linked to this paper by Aaron Halfaker, who's one of the leading researchers of Wikipedia, who pointed out how certain things that the community did to reduce vandalism actually might have gone too far. Right? So looking back at Wikipedia's data and doing research on it actually helped the community realize what is working and what isn't working and help them re-engineer and retool how they work. So these kinds of stats and these, this kind of coverage, if you talk to any Wikipedia board member, is quite central in their minds as they make decisions. But I don't think our policymakers or our decision makers are, as, uh, are paying as much attention to, to some of these broader facts. And now we could, uh, OSM has existed for 12 years, so we should be able to say something about all the amazing data that we have. So that's kind of what I'm going to try to do today. Uh, there's lots of research on OpenStreetMap. There's about 25,000 different papers. But a lot of this old work, which is really great and really important, basically treats prioritized data over people. But I think we need to be doing more research where we need to be studying the people behind the data in addition to the data itself, right? So a lot of these highly cited papers are about comparing the quality of the data set. Like, so is OSM quite good? And to be fair, this is exactly what the early Wikipedia papers were. How does Wikipedia compare to Britannica, right? But the next wave of research really has to be around understanding the people behind the map and how to improve how they work. Um, 
So this is of general interest to lots of academics. I've put on a few famous faces here. So Kareem Lakani runs the Crowd Innovation Lab. Dick Taylor just won the Nobel this year for behavioral experiments. So how can we use little nudges to improve the way that people do things? And there's a body of work out there that we could start applying to OpenStreetMap to start designing ways to make OpenStreetMap contributors feel more rewarded for the work that they're doing. Um, so here's what I'm going to argue is this methodological arbitrage. OSM has all this great community and all this great data, and the so social scientists out there have figured out the theories and the methods to actually answer some of the questions that we care about. So if we actually brought two of those together, we could actually help design a better OSM and also contribute to our body of social science research. So these are two examples that I'll use today, mostly the one on the left. The one on the left is called a difference in difference design. So you pick a region or you pick a place where a certain policy changed, and you pick a control region where the policy didn't change, and you see how those two places evolve differently. For example, this morning we saw talk about how parts of Thailand were edited by the Facebook team. Right? So those kinds of maps make me really excited because you can compare not only how those regions change, but also you, can, you have a control group. You can look at places that they didn't touch and look at how they evolved over time. And by looking at this difference is difference, one can say something about the impact of mechanical editing on OpenStreetMap activity, a question that is, again, a topic of firm and debate today. Right? And so I'm going to apply some of these methods to the questions that we care about. So let me give you three examples of what this looks like in practice. Uh, so the first project that I worked on looks at this old debate of imports. In particular, I focus on the role of what Tiger Imports did in the US to the community over a 10-year period. Right? To understand this question, ideally, one would need to randomly assign Tiger data to some places and not others, and then trace out over 10 years what happened, right? which is really hard to do. Fortunately, so this is uh, uh, OSM right after the Tiger import in 2008. You can see how Canada and Mexico are empty, uh, but, but the US looks really filled in. My work finds, uh, basically discovers, uh, and this is thanks to some of Eric Fisher's maps, basically Tiger quality when it came in varied a lot. So the counties you see here in red were the ones that hadn't been touched by this, what's called the M-tape, or the uh, MAF Tiger uh, Accuracy Improvement Project, which is basically an eight-year-long project to update this map. So places in green basically got a higher level of import as compared to the places in red. So this is something that no one understood when they were importing these data, but this actually happened with an OpenStreetMap. Right? And so if you go to mailing lists, you'll see all these confused-looking contributors asking, hey, my data looks really good, but that data looks really bad. What's going on? And so part of that was linked to this variation in the underlying census data. For me, this is really great because this helps us say something about imports. What would happen if you imported uh, a sort of a half-done but erroneous map versus relatively complete import. And by tracing out, looking at the OSM history file, one can look over time at how these counties evolved and say something clearly about how imports affect communities in the long run, which is precisely what I did. So the first, the bad news. So what I show is if you look at follow-on contributions, these are contributions that are just editing tags or adding new amenities. It takes a while, but in the long run, places that got the higher level imports actually have lower contributions. So people who are sort of anti-import, there's something here that kind of supports their point of view. But there's also something that supports the pro-import point of view. So what you see is that most of these gaps aren't road attribute tags. If you look at what I call distant edits, which are like amenities or restaurants or parks, these follow-on edits, which are more visible, imports actually mean more of those kinds of edits. So what you get with imports is a missing layer of attribute tags, but a higher amount of follow-on tags. So this brings nuance to our debate about what imports do. What imports do is they actually uh, drive people away from the invisible parts of the map, which are things like attributes, and move people. We do get sort of more contributions in the layers that weren't touched by the import. So as we think about designing imports in the future, because I think imports are really important to moving the project forward at a quicker rate, we should think about surfacing some of these invisible tags, because that's where most of the negative effects of imports seem to come up. A second example is a question that I'd been wondering 
which is like, what happens to OpenStreetMap across countries? Why is OpenStreetMap really strong in some countries and not in others? And in particular, I was struck by the role of competition. So in, some, so, uh, in India, for example, uh, Google Maps didn't really launch till 2008 or 9, and this is true for, rest, for a lot of the rest of the world. So my question here is, uh, how does competition from an alternative source affect what happens on OpenStreetMap? Is are people getting more aware of mapping, getting more ideological, and then going into OpenStreetMap? Or are they looking just for something to use? And when they have an alternative, they leave OpenStreetMap. So here, again, I use sort of a similar design as before. Google actually enters different countries at dramatically different points in time because they're sorting out the licensing issues. Right? So some countries they enter early, some countries they enter late. So you can use that as a quasi-experiment to figure out how Google's entry affects contributions on OpenStreetMap. So I kind of went through that exercise, and what I found is kind of this diversion effect. What you see is that amongst established contributors, competition actually increases contributions. So they actually start protecting OpenStreetMap more, and they start making more contributions. But newcomers stop coming to OpenStreetMap at the same rate as which they did before. Right? So again, competition is shaping OSM communities in, in important ways. Perhaps most interestingly, I looked at this effect of competition in places with a song, strong social structure, so places with mailing lists and physical events versus places without. And what I saw is that this negative effect on newcomers completely goes away. So what you see is that these other social structures are important not only because they build community, but they also might be important in helping newcomers understand the value of open data versus commercial data. So again, we can bring debate, uh, we can bring data to this question of how competition affects contributions. Finally, there's some new work that I'm excited about uh, where there's this question about newcomer attrition, right? So as you saw before, men, most of the people we lose make one or two edits and never come back to the map. So what can we do about that? So here I'm actually building on the amazing work that, that Cliff did uh, in the state of Washington, where basically he's been emailing new contributors and saying that, hey guys, I just noticed that you just made an edit. Uh, here are a bunch of resources that could help you. Right? And so this is an email that he sends out and, and has been sending out for over two years now. And so one can see whether these kinds of initiatives are actually useful. Right? Is this effort that we should be taking? If not, what else should we be doing? How should we be designing this letter? Are there, should we be making it shorter, longer? Who should we be sending it to? All of those questions could be answered by a simple experiment where we contact some users and not others and simply compare the editing activity over time. We did something like that, not exactly, with the data that Cliff shared with me. So this is, this is all of the about 1,000 users who he sent messages to. We just compared them to about the 40,000 users in the US who started editing at this time who did not get an email message. What do we find? We find that the users who got the message make about 12.5% more edits over a two-year period. So just a simple email early on has a big effect on how many contributions these users are making. We see that these efforts actually tail off for higher number of edits. So this is someone who's going to make more than five or 10 different edits. It doesn't make as much of a difference. The effect is only 5%. So what you start seeing is, again, some nuance. We should, start, we should find ways to target this messaging precisely to those people who are not likely to be aware of OpenStreetMap or who are not likely to be as committed. We're doing some more work where we're hoping to figure out demographics and wondering whether uh, newcomer messaging helps fix diversity issues uh, in OpenStreetMap. But that's a little bit harder to do because those data don't exist. So there's so many more questions to answer. I, I have a huge list of these. So how does access to ima ima imagery affect new contributions? Right? Like the fact that you can now have brand new digital globe imagery in certain places, does that mean more people are coming in. Uh, can we design awards and badges? Uh, some of my colleagues have done work around uh, barn stars in Wikipedia, and they've shown that these awards and badges could be really important. How should we design awards and badges uh, to sort of uh, drive contributions? And, and so the list goes on and on. And so it'd be really interesting to start thinking about these questions from a data-driven perspective rather than purely uh, just debating about these things and starting to build a structure within OpenStreetMap in which we can quantitatively test the answers to these questions, both to improve their design and also to stop doing the things that don't work as well.
So um, long-term vision would be to have something like Wikimedia Research, which is like a physical organization with an office, where all that they do is run experiments on that platform and try to inform the policy. So rather than have policy uh, be hashed out on mailing lists, can we bring these little experiments and can we formalize that process with an open street map? And that's something that I would love. Uh, in the short-term vision, I think, uh, is are there opportunities to find ways to collaborate with individual academics uh, who are increasingly coming out of the ivory tower. So the new vision of the academic you should have is the academic as a plumber rather than the academic uh, in the ivory tower. And so what we're interested in doing is actually getting our hands dirty and fixing problems in the world and hopefully learning something about human behavior at the same time. So I, you'll find that uh, there's a huge community of people that works on online communities, but very few of them look at geospatial data or open street map. And so are there ways to build in those collaborations? And this is something that I've been working on for the last three or four years and, and be excited to have more of these conversations. So I want to just end with let's, let's experiment. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Any questions? I suppose I should ask the question. Uh, <laughs> That's Cliff, by the way. <laughs> um, and it won't be about uh, new users, it's, it's about imports. Um, we did a, um, a huge building import in Seattle, building addresses in Seattle. And we don't have any hard data, but what we got is a sense that it really helped people add businesses to OpenStreetMap because the building was there, they didn't have to go look for it. Um, a lot of the tools like Maps.me, Maps .me, OSM and you could actually see the outline of the building, you could see the address, so now you could just add that restaurant, the bar, the cannabis shop, um, <laughs> we have those two, um, pretty easily. And, and we found that that seemed to help people. Now what I don't know is, I, I, my sense is that import in that case really helped. Um, now hearing this morning talking about artificial intelligence, that kind of scares me because they're going to add a lot of data and what do they need me for? I like drawing buildings. So, so on the first point, our, this whole experiment actually just validates your point. So these imports really help the amenity and those kinds of layers. What they didn't help was the road tags. So they didn't help sort of like, is this a gravel road or a highway? Those kinds of attributes. Uh, I also think a lot of the debates get stuck at a high level, but I think the devil is in the details. So I think it's about how do we do the import is actually sort of the real question to ask. Uh, for example, I know in Seattle, you kind of had did a manual import, right? Like, so you get the imported data, but then you have people manually validate all of that. I actually suspect that as a positive effect, even on on the even on the attribute tax, right? And so, so, uh, so this this approach then sort of like brings us to a very different set of questions. Which is like, what are the different ways we could design this process, and which one is more effective, rather than is this overall a good thing or not? One more question. Um, so I really, so I'm Leisha Pale and I'm a professor here at University of Colorado and I really love the work that you're doing and that you're trying to be both, um, well all, you're trying to inhabit academia and make contributions in all sorts of different ways and I think that's fabulous. I have a question for you as an assistant professor. Are you worried that your engagement with OSM is difficult for you to think about the tenure track, for example, and how are you resolving those things together? Because so much social science is happening in the academy, and yet so many of us want to have the kind of impact you're talking about, and we have to walk that line. So I'm wondering how you're managing that and what advice you have for those who are taking, approaching this from a social science perspective. Absolutely. So, so I think there are two different uh, ways to do that. One is there is a community of even academics out there like me who are explicitly studying online communities and pitching to them OpenStreetMap as one case that's actually similar to the communities they're studying is actually very helpful because they're interested in these same questions around how do we engage communities, questions like that. A second level, which if you can actually swing it is even better and broader, is what can we learn about human behavior? So there are lots of academics interested in questions around why do people volunteer? Why do, they, why do people do things for free? 
How does social interaction work in groups? And so it's about finding a right lens for these questions that helps to really bring this out to a broader audience. And the final thing that I always do is convince people of the commercial importance of some of this stuff. So the challenge with OpenStreetMap is it's not, it's, I tell people it's like Linux. You probably used it, but you don't know about it. And so then I talk about how increasingly many commercial organizations, and so that's the process of education. And I think that process will get easier over time as well. So all three of those can be useful tools. Perfect, thank you all so much.